Hello. Welcome to the Ninth Passage. I'm Dale Cloninger, the author of the story. I've been asked to read certain selections out of the story for you, but before I begin doing that, I need to sort of set the stage for the passages which I am going to read. They will all be taken from the first half of the novel. In the prologue, what I do in the story is to set the stage, that is, the times, the people, and the place. In chapter one, I introduce the storyteller. And the storyteller begins the story and you learn about him and his family. Chapter two uh, begins the story involving the teacher and the student. And what I've chosen to read for you today is the very first meeting of the student and the teacher, and then a couple of other sections relating to their relationship over the years. The scene opens at the end of what is the intermediate choir class. It's the first day of school of the first year that the teacher is uh, assumed his duties there. He resigned himself to making the best of it, for things would not be any better next year. The plans for the new senior high that the principal displayed during the orientation revealed that the band and choir rooms would again be adjacent. At least the new facilities would be air-conditioned and soundproofed. They will also share the same building with the gym at the far end of the campus next to the football stadium. Remember class, he reminded us as we crushed our way out the narrow front door. Walk down the sidewalk to the corner, up the street to the north entrance of the main building. You're not to enter the building through the front door and are not to cut across the softball field. These instructions met with a chorus of boos that undoubtedly sounded flat to Alex's musically trained ear. The route he prescribed was the longest path to the main junior high building but that was what Mr. First, the principal, had specified. Unlike Mr. First, we were unconcerned with the dirt our feet would track on the newly varnished hardwood floors or with the loud noise the traffic would generate as we tromped past administrative offices. Our concern centered on the shortest distance between choir and the next class. After the last student bolted through the front door, Alex settled into a swivel chair at his desk. The renovations had rotated the house's orientation. The front and back of the original house became the east and west sides of the choir room. The house's back turned side door slightly behind and to the right of Alex's desk. Only the sound of the window fans penetrated the quiet of the empty room. Engrossed in the papers before him, he didn't hear anyone enter the room, yet he sensed the presence of someone even before he heard a voice. Mr. Driver, the voice spoke with such a distinctive tone that Alec immediately recognized it as a soprano. Yes, automatically responded as he turned in the direction of the voice. I'm sorry, the voice went on. I wasn't able to be here first period. I had to help new students find their classes. His eyes riveted to hers. Alex actually heard a word the voice uttered. Dark and penetrating, his eyes appeared to sparkle as she spoke. Her long straight hair ended with a flip as it graced her shoulders. She wore a green print sundress so appropriate to the still dog days of summer in central Florida. Her skin was olive, darker than what he expected of Southern Bells, and without a single noticeable blemish to spoil its clear, smooth complexion. She stopped speaking, waiting for a response from Alec. The sudden silence brought him out of his stupor. There's no problem. We were just getting organized today, he said with a broad smile. Her name, what's her name, he thought. He couldn't remember whether she had said it or not. Let me make sure that you're on my roll, and if I marked you absent, I'll change it. It's Tracy Ashbury with a U, she offered. Looking up and answering, he asked, like the village in England? Yes, but how did you know? Came her surprise reply. I've been through there. It's a beautiful country village. Catching his thoughts, he fumbled through the papers until finding his role. Yes, here you are, right at the top of the list. It's nice of you to drop by and explain why you were absent. Most students wouldn't be so thoughtful. 
He hoped she would pick up on his last statement for he found himself in no hurry to end the conversation. I have another reason for seeing you after class. I understand you're going to be the choir director at the Presbyterian Church. For the foreseeable future, at least, are you interested in joining, he asked, hoping not to sound too anxious. That's what I wanted to ask you, she answered. You certainly don't need my permission. I mean, I would, uh, but, well, the choir would welcome you, he stumbled, hating himself for it. Teenagers usually aren't allowed in the adult choir. There's a youth choir, but not many kids join. I'd rather be in the older choir, she explained. You just show up Thursday night and I'll handle the rest, he replied, making no attempt to control the broad smile on his face. Thanks, that's great. I've got to run. I'm already late for my next class. Thanks again. See you tomorrow, she called back over her shoulder as she left the room. Alex thought he noticed a definite lilt to her voice as he watched her scurry off in a half run, her hair bouncing as she moved. It was the first time he noticed the matching green ribbon to her hair. She left through the building's back door, not following the circuitous route laid out for the junior high students. The senior high students were permitted a more direct route from the building because of its location at the other end of the block. The five-minute break between classes proved insufficient for the longer route. The exchange lasted at most three minutes, an interval he would never forget. She created an impression highly disproportionate to the short time she spent with him and many times more powerful than left by any other woman he had ever met. It wasn't that he lacked experience with them, but all the others, including a former wife, now, reading from page 56, the bottom paragraph. After choir practice on Thursday nights, Alec walked a mile and a half back to his apartment, stopping for coffee or a late night snack at the Owl Diner, an all night diner formed by the merging of two symmetrical halves shipped from the Midwest on a flatbed rail car, just a half a block from the church on Park Street. On the first Thursday in November, choir practice ended later than usual because the choir began preparations for special music. Alex scheduled for the Sunday before Thanksgiving Day. He planned an overture of Jester Pateau's nationalistic and religious hymns that required smooth transitions without pauses between songs, a difficult technique he discovered for some older choir members. As usual, Alec waited until everyone in the choir left before turning out the lights and locking the east door. The door opened onto Fort Harrison Avenue, but faced east straight down Park Street. The skies had been clear when Alec left for rehearsal that night. By the time practice ended three hours later, the first cold front of the season had already moved through the city. The temperature dropped almost 30 degrees, and a slow but penetrating drizzle had begun. Clad only in short sleeve sports shirt and cotton slacks, he shivered as he stepped out into the night. He looked up and muttered, where in the hell did this come from, forgetting for the moment where he was? He dashed the half block to the diner for refuge, thinking maybe tonight he would take a cab home. As he sprinted past the parked cars along the curb, he heard a clearly recognizable voice call from a lowered window of a parked car. Mr. Driver, lingering after practice to talk with one of the older choir members, Tracy had just entered her car that was parked on the diner's side of the street. Combing her damp, windswept hair, she saw Alex, so inadequately clad, leave the church. Immediately recognizing his plight, she waited until he approached her car before she rolled down the window and called. Alex stopped and turned and said with a welcome relief, Hi, Tracy. Great weather. I wonder where it went. It must be chilly, he thought, for his grown man to be standing in a bone-chilling rain with such a broad smile on his face. He made no attempt, however, to hide his pleasure. Would you like a ride home, she offered. Alec hesitated for an instant, looking up and down the street and seeing no one. He answered, well, he looked again at the empty taxi stand just a half a block away. You've talked me into it, he answered as his smile broadened. How about a cup of coffee or hot chocolate at the diner first? My treat. Uncertain where the nerve came from for him to ask her for coffee, he delighted in the fact that he managed to muster up the courage. Not wanting to prolong Alex's exposure to the weather, Tracy quickly entered. Okay. He opened the door for her to get out, and together they quickly walked a short distance to the diner. Once inside, they found the booth and seated themselves. Alec excused himself for a quick trip to the men's room, where he drifted, dried his face and, and arms with paper towels and combed his hair back into its usual neat, streamlined place. 
Returning to their booth, he glanced around and noticed that the weather had reduced the small amount of other diners to four. In his relief, he recognized only the cook and the waitress. The waitress sauntered over to their booth and made the inane remark about the weather being nice for ducks that Alec had deliberately avoided in his greeting to Tracy. Each made a pretense at laughing. Upon learning that the cook had baked a fresh apple pie, they each ordered a piece. After a few exchanges about how rehearsal went that night, Alec turned the conversation to a more personal note. It's really nice of you to offer to drive me home. I, I thought I, I would have liked to get a cab at the stand down the street. That's okay. I'm happy to do it. The weather was r really turned miserable, she responded. Will your parents be worried if you don't get home on time? After all, practice lasted later than usual. Taking me home will even get you back later, he said, hoping to gain some insight about her relationship with her parents. They'll probably already be in bed and asleep when I get home. With all my activities that I'm in, I get home very late sometimes. Besides, they're very understanding and trust my judgment more than some parents would. Tracy toyed with her water glass as she spoke. You're very fortunate to have such understanding parents, he offered, without fully realizing Alec began to play with his water glass. As they were talking, the owner, who talked with Alec on most of his previous visits to the diner, walked out of the kitchen carrying two pieces of hot apple pie. As they placed him on the table, he looked at Tracy and then at Alec. I admire your taste in both company and pie, he said with a wink that Alec hoped Tracy didn't see. Yes, Alec quickly responded. This young lady has graciously offered to drive me home after choir practice. I thought the least I could do is buy her a cup of coffee. Your delicious pie was a pleasant surprise. Yeah, sure, was his only reply as he walked away, glancing back over his shoulder and smiling. I'm sorry about that. I hope I haven't embarrassed you, Alec offered nervously for any sign of disapproval. I'm not embarrassed. I think it's cute, she grinned. I guess being twi uh, like a good deal older than you makes me feel that you might uh, feel uncomfortable, he said in a low voice, still looking for any sign of disapproval from Tracy. You're not that old, and besides, I think age differences aren't that important. There's a number of girls I know, though. Uh, Ruth Ann is, is dating a, a senior at the university, and some of the other girls think that's just awful. I think it's fine. Then you wouldn't let a large difference in age prevent you from seeing someone, he ventured. Not at all, if I liked him, she responded. Then if someone older were to ask you out, you, you would consider it. He realized he was pushing for a definite answer that came more forthrightly than he expected. Why, Mr. Driver, Tracy responded, looking straight into his eyes. Are you asking me for a date? Sometime later, Alec had been on a trip to Mexico over the Christmas holidays, and his sister, Denise, had arranged to pick him up when he flew back into Tampa International Airport. And so she had picked him up, and not really knowing about his activities in recent weeks, she began to ask about it. Tell me, she asked, about this lady you've obviously been seeing but not talking about. I guess it's silly for me not to have mentioned her. I suppose I should have. Pausing for a moment to reflect on Tracy, he continued, she's the most beautiful girl I've ever met. She's bright, talented, and very charming. I'm transfixed by her dark, penetrating eyes. She, uh, whoa, I thought you were just having a simple date or two. It sounds like you're in love again. She bit her lip, knowing that she should not have added the word again. She heaved a sigh of relief when Alec responded, No, it's the first time I've been in love. It's as though I've never been in love. I feel like that what's in the past never happened. It's simply a nightmare from which I'm finally awaking to discover it was only a bad dream. Alec's words were slow and deliberate. Who, who is this lady? And where did you meet you? Uh, uh, Denise asked with a keen sense of interest. Her name is Tracy Ashbury. A name as melodic and beautiful as she is. She's in my choir, he answered innocently. Ashbury, that name has a familiar ring. Where does she sit in the church choir, she queried. She sings soprano in both my choirs. You're dating a member of your class, she asked, trying to remain calm but not succeeding very well. Calm down, sis. I thought you'd understand. I've had her parents' permission. It's no big deal, Alec tried to explain. No big deal, she shouted. Don't mock me, he insisted, perturbed at her reaction. Besides, everything is innocent. I haven't been anything but a perfect gentleman. Would you have me believe that a 37-year-old divorced war veteran's relationship with an attractive 17 or 18-year-old schoolgirl is strictly platonic, she asked with a decided tone of disbelief. 
Yes. Uh, no, I, I mean, of, of course, part of the attraction I feel uh, for her is sensual. But I've no intention of letting those feelings get out of hand, at least while she's a student in my class, Alec answered defiantly. During the meantime, everyone else in town will think otherwise. Look, Alec, I love you dearly, but, but you've got to understand that this community is not exactly liberal and open-minded. People here are church-going, Bible-toting, God-fearing, moral idealists. It makes little difference what you or I think. After all, we're related. You must consider what this town thinks, for it's all these people who will determine, to a large extent, what happens. Don't be surprised if you hear from them, and soon... Then he shook her head in disbelief at her brother's attitude and feeling sorry that she had asked. She muttered under her breath, I don't believe this.